to discuss um, non-SC elevation acute coronary syndromes. The main source of the information that I'm going to be giving is the 2014 AHA ACC guidelines. And it's been updated with some information from the 2020 guidelines that were released by the European Society of Cardiology back in August um, 2019. Uh, sorry, August 2020. So just a quick review. Um, the class of recommendations, when you mentioned that it's class one, it's a procedure or treatment that should be performed or administered. Class 2A, it's reasonable, the benefits outweigh the risk. Class 2B, benefits outweigh the risk as well, and treatment should be uh, may be considered. If it's class 3, it means that it doesn't have benefit or it doesn't have any harm. The levels are basically the strengths of the available um, data from trials. Level A, it's evaluated multiple populations. Level B, limited populations were evaluated. And level C, it's only consensus of experts, case studies, so very limited um, data on them. So the definition of acute coronary syndrome, it's basically an abrupt reduction in your coronary blood flow. And just remember the branch point to differentiate an NSTE ACS from a STEMI is the SC elevation or the presence of a new left bundle branch block, which in itself is an indication for immediate cath. And just remember that in the absence of persistent ST elevation, it's suggestive of NSTE ACS, except for patients who have a true a myocardial, a posterior myocardial infarction. In this case, it can actually be um, electrocardiography silent. Initial assessments, just your ABCs, you need a 12 lead EKG, um, bedside equipment, monitor oxygen, remember to load aspirin, and to give nitrates unless there's contraindications. So what are the contraindications to nitrate administration? Um, conditions that are preload dependent, so in patients who have severe aortic stenosis, those who have suspected right ventricular infarct, and then patients who have hypotension, those with marked bradycardia, tachycardia, and patients who have received a um, phosphate esterase um, inhibitors within the past 24 to 48 hours. Just remember that when you guys are evaluating for ACS and you're using the typical atypical in cardiac chest pain, you need to exercise caution in women, diabetics, and older adults because these are patients who are likely to present with atypical symptoms. Unstable angina, it's defined as rest angina, and it usually lasts longer than 20 minutes. One that limits physical activity or an increase in angina from the patient's baseline. Whether that's more frequency in um, occurrences, whether it lasts longer or it, exerts, um, it occurs with less exertion than the patient's previous angina. Um, these are what you consider as unstable angina. With regards to its comparison with NSTEMI, just remember that they share the same pathophysiologic mechanism the main difference between unstable angina and NSTEMI is the severity of myocardial necrosis. In NSTEMI, you have myocardial necrosis that's severe enough to cause um, cardiac biomarker leakage that you can detect through laboratory assays. However, with the rise of the use of high sensitivity troponin, we detect more and more of NSTEMIs and like basically see less of unstable anginas. So how do you evaluate them? Um, it's a 1C recommendation to get a 12 lead EKG within 10 minutes of arrival. And just remember that the initial EKG can be normal or can be non-diagnostic. In that case, if you have a suspicion for ACS, you should repeat your EKGs at 15 to 30 minute intervals during the first hour. And you can repeat an EKG if the symptoms recur. Just remember that you can have a normal um, EKG in patients with NSTEMI, but you can suspect um, or expect ST depression, transient ST elevation, and or prominent T-wave inversions. If there is a patient that presents with persistent SC elevation or anterior SC depression that is suggestive of a true posterior MI, then you treat this according to the STEMI um, clinical practice guidelines. So who do you suspect should have um, posterior MI? So if you guys look at the anterior leads, so just remember that there is no lead in your standard 12 lead EKG that can actually, or is dedicated to evaluating the posterior wall of your heart. So, Indirectly, the anterior leads are able to evaluate the posterior part. It's like a reciprocal lead. So if you guys look at B1, B2, especially in B2, you guys see horizontal SC depression. You have a tall R wave in which it's broad. It's more than a box, more than 30 milliseconds. You see upright T waves, like very upright ones, tall ones, and a dominant R wave in which you have a larger R R wave than your S wave, then you should suspect the possibility of um, posterior MI. So just remember that in patients who have posterior MI, if it's associated, um, when you have left circumflex or right coronary artery occlusions, it can be electrically silent. 
In patients who present with inferior STEMI, so your 2, 3, and AVF, you need to get a right-sided lead to detect the evidence of right ventricular infarction. Around 40% of your patients who have inferior STEMI will have concomitant right ventricular infarction. And at the same time, it's reasonable to obtain a supplemental um, EKG lead, so request V7 to V9 in patients whose initial EKG is non-diagnostic and who you are suspecting an intermediate to high risk of ACS. So say you have a patient complaining of chest pain, you monitor troponin, um, it has an ACS pattern, your EKG is non-diagnostic, think about the possibility that it's a posterior MI, get leads V7 to V9. Um, findings consistent with NSTEM, you guys already know this one, so we'll skip it. And just a quick review, 2-3 AVF corresponds uh, to your inferior wall. 1 AVL, V5, V6 corresponds to your lateral wall. V1 to V4 corresponds to your anterior septal wall. If your lateral leads are affected, think of either a left circumflex or one of the diagonal branches of your LAD. If it's an inferior lead, 2, 3 AVF, think that it might be your right um, coronary artery or your left circumflex. Anterior septal, think about your LAD. If you're initially. I just want to add something Mark, about the AVR, the mm -hmm. AVR. Mm -hmm. If you see a good SG elevation there, mm -hmm. you should worry about left main. Yep, agreed. Thanks for the info, Manel. I, I missed that, sorry. Can you repeat it? Go ahead, Manel. Go ahead, I'm driving. Can you do that? <laughs> Can you just repeat yourself, Manal? I missed I could not hear you. Yeah, I said the AVR, it's the only one Mark did not color. So also keep an eye on it because if you see it at the elevation on IVR, it can be a big deal because you should worry about left main disease. So if you see it at the elevation and then you see depression everywhere else, then it might be a left main disease, which is a very big yes, You should call cardiology. Thanks, Manal. So if you have an initial EKG that's non-diagnostic, um, and you have um, clinical suspicion of ACS, as we mentioned earlier, um, every 15 to 30 minutes, you can get a new EKG. And just remember that in patients who have baseline T-wave inversion, um, in patients who present with NSTEMI, they can have a thing called pseudo-normalization of your T-waves, where they become upright. Your high-sensitivity troponin assays, they have a negative predictive value of, of more than 99%. So in the previous guidelines, um, in the 2014 guidelines released by ACC and AHA, they um, predominantly use like contemporary assays, so the old troponins. So during that time, they recommended that you obtain troponins at presentation and three to six hours after symptom onset. When they started using high sensitivity troponin, they figured that you could actually um, detect these troponin rises earlier. So the ESC 2020 guidelines actually recommend that you get troponin levels on presentation, at presentation, and then one hour after. If the time to symptom onset is unclear or is uh, ambiguous, then you use the time of presentation as the time of onset. So important questions to always ask is, does the patient have any form of coronary blockage? Do we need to cath the patient and when do we need to do it? So this was a question that was asked before. Um, what's the role of trending troponins? So I'd say for this one, it's always a case-by-case -case basis. So if you have a low pretest probability, you have a troponin that's pretty much stable or it's slowly going up, it won't add much to keep on trending it. Say this is a patient with end-stage renal disease, um, non-specific um, chest symptoms, you see a troponin leak, you recheck it after one, two hours, it's still at the same level. There's no further benefit in trending it higher. Like it won't change your management. Say this is a patient with known heart failure, comes in with another episode of exacerbation. You see an initial rise in the troponin, you repeat it, it's pretty much stable, it's not going up, the patient is not deteriorating clinically. There's not much role in having to repeat your troponins until it peaks and until you let it fall down. So just remember that in patients who present with ACS, the troponins will rise very quickly over a span of two to three hours. There's a thing called a plaque rupture trajectory. So a massive increase in your troponins is expected in patients who have ACS. So if you do ask what's the rationale in patients who are being already managed as an ACS or say managing, medically managed as NSTEMI, and then some of the cardiologists tend to uh, trend the troponin to peak, so it's basically for some prognostic significance. 
So there are studies that indicate that the higher the peak troponins get, um, basically the worse the outcomes. And this is something which some of the cardiologists use to estimate the infarct size. So there's a moderate correlation between the highest level of the troponin as well as the estimated infarct size. But most of the studies that have come out um, basically did this for patients who presented with STEMIs and not NSTEMIs. So mostly for prognostic significance. Another way in which you could monitor or trend troponins is if you have a diagnosis that's uncertain or the patients present with their current symptoms. Say this is a patient who presents with suspected myocarditis or pericarditis, has a typical chest pain. You wanna make sure that the patient doesn't have any um, concomitant ACS. You wanna trend the troponin, you can. Otherwise, there's not really much use of trending the troponin it's, uh, in itself. And at the same time, if you want to estimate the infarct size, there are other modalities that you could do it, like uh, basically get to So if you guys want to read up on this, um, there's a study that was released by the Journal of the American Heart Association in April. It's entitled Relationship Between Peak Troponin Values and Long-Term Ischemic Events Among Medically Managed Patients with Acute Coronary Syndromes. Um, any, any question with regards to this one? None? Awesome. So what do you guys do when you guys um, admit someone who has a non-ST ACS? So one of the first things that you guys need to do after the initial therapy is to risk stratify the patients. When you risk stratify them, you're identifying patients who would benefit from an early invasive strategy, meaning you're trying to determine who are the patients that would benefit from receiving a cath within 24 hours. So there are two tools that you could use per ACC and AHA. Um, the TIMI as well as the GRACE course, which I'll go over. The European Society of Cardiology, Cardiology recommend the use of GRACE score. So basically a TIMI risk score, it's to risk stratify patients with presumed ischemic chest pain. It's based from the data from TIMI 11B as well as the ESSENCE trials where they identified seven variables that are independently predictive of outcomes in patients with unstable angina or those with NSTEMI. And it's useful in predicting 30-day and one-year mortality in patients with non-ST um, elevation ACS. So the things that you need to score them with are age more than 65, the presence of um, at least three cardiovascular risk factors. If they have known coronary artery disease in which the stenosis documented is more than or equal to 50%. Recent aspirin use uh, within the past seven days. If the patient presents with severe angina defined as at least two episodes in 24 hours, um, EKG ST changes, and positive cardiac biomarkers. So each one of these, you give them a score of one. So the maximum score that you can get in patients for this is a seven. So a higher TIMI risk score is associated with um, poorer outcomes. Anyone who you score from zero to two is considered low risk. Three to five is intermediate risk, and six to seven would indicate high risk. And as mentioned earlier, these are, this is used to identify patients who would benefit from an early invasive strategy. So you get a TIMI score, a TIMI score is at least three and above, think about an early invasive strategy, cat within 24 hours. The GRACE risk model, um, it's a more complex model, but it estimates your um, outcomes as well in hospital and six month mortality in patients with an ACS. So at the same time, it can also be used to check who would benefit from an early invasive strategy. So you score them, it's more than 140, think early invasive strategy. So this is a little bit more complex. So usually um, people use GRACE scores for sicker patients. So you check the age, you input the age, you input the heart rate, systolic blood pressure, creatinine, presence of cardiac arrest on admission, the presence of SC segment deviation and EKG, presence of abnormal cardiac enzymes, and at the same time, your kilip class, signs and symptoms of um, pulmonary edema, RALS, JVD, or cardiogenic shock. This is something which you guys also frequently encounter. It's called the heart score. So the heart score, um, its main utility is if the patients present to the ED with undifferentiated chest pain, and you wanna figure out if the patient should be sent home or if it's someone that you can admit for clinical observation, you can use the heart score. So it's based on your history, EKG findings, age, risk factors, as well as troponin levels. A score of zero to three, you can safely discharge home. A score of four to six, you need to admit for clinical observation. Very, very high heart scores. You also need to consider early invasive strategies.
So it's reasonable for patients who have a possible ACS, if they have a normal serial EKG, normal troponins, um, let them undergo a treadmill EKG or a stress test before discharge or within 72 hours after discharge. The ESC 2020 actually recommended a transthoracic echo and should be performed in patients who are admitted for um, non-ST ACS. Based on their recommendations as well, they're recommending stress imaging over your standard um, um, EKGs, uh, exercise EKGs to, due to greater diagnostic accuracy. They also recommend that patients who are admitted with non-ST ACS um, basically undergo tele and rhythm monitoring up to 24 hours or to PCI, whichever comes first. Treatment for these patients, um, oxygen-wise, admin administer oxygen for anyone with an oxygen saturation of less than 90%. You guys already know this. Give nitroglycerine um, for patients with continuing ischemic chest pain. You can give up to three doses, space five minutes apart. If it's persistent, you can give IV nitroglycerine. And just remember, as I mentioned earlier, it should not be administered for patients who recently received a phosphodiesterase inhibitor within 24 hours of sildenafil or vardenafil or within 48 hours of tadalafil. I wanted to let you guys know that even though we use relief with nitrates as one of the criteria on how we diagnose patients to have cardiac, non-cardiac, or atypical chest pain, it's been constantly shown by studies that the relief of chest pain with nitroglycerin is not predictive of acute coronary syndrome. In fact, when Henriksen et al. studied the use of sublingual nitroglycerin, 41% of patients who eventually were found not to have ACS had relief of symptoms with sublingual nitroglycerin, compared to just 35% of patients who eventually had documented ACS. So what's the explanation behind this? It's unclear. Sometimes people say that it might be a very, very strong placebo effect with regards to nitroglycerin. And the second is if the patient has concomitant esophageal spasms, it can be relieved by nitroglycerin as well. In contrary to that, just remember that just because you gave a patient a GI cocktail, so you gave pantoprazole, chest pain resolves, it does not predict the absence of your ACS. So these are two important concepts that I want you guys to um, remember. Questions here? Awesome. Morphine, um, only if the patients have continued chest pain despite uh, maximum treatment. And just remember that you guys need to discontinue all of the NSAIDs. You should not initiate NSAIDs. If the patient has been on NSAIDs before, discontinue it in patients who are hospitalized for non-ST ACS because of the risk of major adverse cardiac events. Beta blockers within the first 24 hours in patients who have, um, in all patients except those who exhibit signs of heart failure, those who have low output states, or those who are at risk for cardiogenic shock or if there are other contraindications to beta blockade, prolonged PR interval, second or third degree heart block without pacemaker, active asthma or active airway disease. So calcium channel blockers, you give this um, if there are um, ischemic symptoms and contraindications to beta blocker therapy, or if the beta blocker therapy itself is not successful. Statins for all patients, and remember to give high intensity statin therapy. ACE or ARBs in all patients who have an ejection fraction of less than 40% or those with hypertension, diabetes, or stable chronic kidney disease. So we'll go to the antiplatelets. Just remember that you guys need to give a non enteric coated chewable aspirin loading dose of 162 to 325 milligrams immediately after presentation. The older guidelines recommended um, has a higher range as to what dose of aspirin you can give as a maintenance dose. But studies after that have frequently shown that low dose aspirin has the same ischemic benefits compared to that high dose aspirin with, no, um, with a lower risk of bleeding. So maintenance dose, the ones that we use just 81 milligrams per day should be sufficient. If the patient is unable to take aspirin because of hypersensitivity or major GI intolerance, then you guys should consider giving Plavix. And just remember to give a P2Y12 inhibitor in all patients for up to 12 months um, in patients who you treat with either an early invasive or an ischemia-guided strategy. 
So the ESC 2020 actually recommends Plavix only when Prasugril or Ticagrelor are not available, cannot be tolerated, or are contraindicated. So there have been studies that indicate that clopidogrel has less reliability when it comes to um, um, antithrombotic effects. It has a slower onset of action, and there have been studies that show improved outcomes with both prasugril and ticagrelor in comparison to Plavix. I think yes. there's even a mortality benefit with ticagrelor. Yes. Right? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you know about the risk of bleeding with uh, prasugril and uh, ticagrelor? So higher risk of bleeding for both. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. So for the ISORI ACT-5 trial that re they released back in 2019, um, these were patients who had acute coronary syndrome in whom an invasive evaluation was planned. They evaluated or compared prasugril versus ticagrelor. And what they found was patients who were treated with prasugril had a 2.4% absolute reduction in the primary outcome of death, non-fatal MI, as well as stroke. Although in comparison to prasugril, both prasugril and ticagrelor um, had similar bleeding rates. So the ESC 2020, based on the ISR on the ISORI ACT-5 trial, recommended that prasugril should be preferred over ticagrelor for patients who are admitted with um, non-STACS and who undergo PCI. So prasugril over ticagrelor. With regards to anticoagulation, just remember that um, anticoagulation is done in addition to antiplatelet therapy for all patients, irrespective of the initial treatment strategy that you want to place them on. You have multiple options, but us, we mostly use unfractionated heparin. The main difference with regards to anticoagulation is that in patients who present with NSTEMI or unstable angina, there is no role for um, fibrinolytic therapy. So this is a question that we frequently ask or get asked as well. So when's the best time to actually start a second antiplatelet agent? Because we're commonly taught that in patients who get admitted for ACA, ACS, you need to start aspirin, you need to start Plavix, you need to start them on DAP. Why don't we do this in the hospital? So currently, there are no large-scale randomized trials that support the pretreatment strategy. So by pretreatment strategy, we mean giving a P2Y12 inhibitor in addition to your aspirin before the patients undergo a cath. The AC Coast trial that was done in 2013 showed that pretreatment with prasugril in patients who have NSTEMI did not reduce major cardiovascular risk and in fact increase bleeding risks. So those patients who were pretreated with prasugril before cath, on top of aspirin, had higher incidences of TIMI major and life-threatening bleeding um, compared to the control group. The ISORI ACT-5 trial as well um, in 2019 that evaluated ticagrelor versus prasugrel did not find any benefit of a pretreatment strategy. And there in that pretreatment strategy, they utilized ticagrelor. So with regards to pretreatment with a P2Y12 inhibitor, the ESC guidelines recommend that due to the lack of an established benefit, you should not do routine pretreatment with a P2Y12 inhibitor in patients who you admit with non-ST ACS. If the patients have um, a known coronary anatomy and you're already planning on early invasive management. So you have a patient you admit for unstable angina or you admit for NSTEMI, you're planning on doing a cath within 24 hours, you guys do not need to start a P2Y12 inhibitor. Why? You can do an angiogram. Eventually, if the patients will need some form of a PCI, you can give them um, the faster acting P2Y12 inhibitors. So between the angiogram and bet um, directly before the PCI, that's when you can um, give them the prasugrel, give them the ticagrelor. If you are planning a delayed invasive management, meaning you're not going to cath within 24 hours, you're thinking about cathing within 25 to 72 hours, you can consider giving the P2Y12 inhibitors as long as the patient's bleeding risk is low. Is this clear? Questions about this? No? Awesome. 
So we have four available um, P2Y12 inhibitors, your Plavix, your Prasugrel, your Ticagrelor, and the relatively new one, um, Cangrelor. So the main thing that I want you guys to take from here is that Plavix, it has a delayed onset of effect, about two to six hours, versus your Prasugrel and your Ticagrelor. Within 30 minutes, they can have an effect. The ESC guidelines also recommend that um, basically treatment with your GP2B3 antagonist, your abcixumab, pirofiban, and your FTV fabatide um, is not recommended in patients whom coronary anatomy is not known. It's something though which they recommend as a bailout in case there is um, evidence of no reflow or a thrombotic complication. So just choices for anticoagulation. Um, it's Hold on, Mark. Yeah, go Question ahead. about the, can you go back to the previous slide? This one, mm -hmm. go ahead. Mm -hmm. So the GP2B3A, I think it used to be recommended for a TIMI of five or more. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is this still, uh, you know, a thing or I didn't anymore? see it on the ESE 2020. I'd have to look into that particular uh, TIMI flow issues. So sorry, sorry. Okay. TIMI Oh, you mean the team is scoring? The team is scoring, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So last the, time I, I, I didn't look at the 2020, yeah. but what I know uh, is. If, Go ahead, Manu. So usually, if it's five or more, you give it. If it's yeah. uh, lower, you don't. Yeah. Uh, or you can or you can't. But the, here, there, you're not mentioning anything about that. So I was wondering if it changed in 2020 because I yeah. haven't looked at these. The 2014 one recommended that in patients who have um, higher TIMI scores, you can use it. It has some benefit. But in the EEC 2020, I didn't see if there was actually a score that they recommended. I'll have to double check that one. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Um, with regards to the recommended treatment strategy for anticoagulation, um, you know, enoxaparin, bivalirudine, pondopyrinox, as well as unfractionated heparin, you guys already know this. When it comes to risk stratification, um, basically it's a choice between early invasive versus ischemia guided strategy. So we discussed this earlier, early invasive strategy, cath within 24 hours. Ischemia guided strategy, you consider cath in patients who fail medical therapy those who have persistent objective evidence of ischemia, or those with very high prognostic risk, either through your TIMI or your GRACE scores. There's a thing called an immediate invasive strategy, which is you need to cath the patient within a couple of hours. ESC recommends to do this in patients who have hemodynamic instability or cardiogenic shock, those who have recurrent or refractory chest pain, those with life-threatening arrhythmias or cardiac arrests, Anyone with mechanical complications of MI, anyone who presents with heart failure that's clearly related to your ACS, or those with um, presence of SC segment depression more than one millimeter and more than or equal to six leads. Um, delayed invasive, anyone who needs a cath um, 20, um, 25 to 72 hours. I'll discuss the indications as well per the 2014 um, ACC AHA guideline. But the rationale behind doing a delayed invasive strategy is that you can defer angiography so that you're able to actually stabilize the plaque with antithrombotic and or anti-ischemic therapies before you do any procedure. So for your ischemia guided strategy, um, these are for patients who you decide to manage medically first and you do non-invasive testing prior to discharge, which can lead to information on whether you wanna do a andrography or not. So this is from the 2014 ACC AHA guidelines, immediate invasive for refractory angina, hemodynamic instability, signs of heart failure, sustained VT or VFib. If the patients present with low TIMI or low GRACE, continue ischemia guided strategy. The patients have a GRACE risk score more than 140, new or presumably new SC depression, early invasive within 24 hours. And I won't go over it into detail, but uh, I'd send the PowerPoint, you guys can take a look, which are the indications for delayed um, invasive therapy. So just remember that in patients who present with non-STACS, whether you um, send them for ischemia-guided strategy or early invasive strategy, you need to start them on aspirin and an anticoagulant. Those patients who you send for early invasive strategy, cath within 24 hours, 
you do not need to pre-treat with P2Y12 inhibitors. Those who you opt to give ischemia-guided strategy on top of your aspirin and your anticoagulant, you can consider adding a P2Y12 inhibitor. Just one question, Mark. So in the ischemia-guided therapy for, uh, you know, for low TEMI score, uh, uh, non-STEMI, mm -hmm. what will be like an optimum uh, time to, to add the second uh, antiplatelet like P2Y12 mm -hmm. inhibitor? So as soon as you can. As soon as you can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if, if you're, if you're, um, so within 20, if you're cathing within 24 hours, there's then not- Then you can hold it? Yeah, you can hold it. But if you're not cathing within 24 hours, you have a low bleeding risk, you can start it. So with, with regards to infarction, just remember that troponin elevations may persist for up to 14 days or even longer. There's currently a paucity of guidelines on how you establish reinfarction during an acute infarct period just on the basis of troponin measurements. So what people suggest is that an absolute increase of 20%, an increase of 20% from previous troponin levels can indicate reinfarction. ESC recommends that you can use your old CKMB because this falls faster than your troponin. So if you guys see a fall in CKMB and suddenly um, there's a sudden increase, you need to think of a possibility of a reinfarction. With regards to your triple antithrombotic therapy, um, no wax over um, vitamin K antagonist. And just remember that what normally happens is that patients who you place on TAT have significantly higher bleeding risk. So what they recommend is that you do dual antithrombotic therapy with the NOAC plus Plavix. Um, I won't go over the type 2 MI. We'll just open the floor for questions if you guys have anything. I do have a question. Actually, there is this uh, new trend after the Colcott trial in 2019 of colchicine in ACS and its role and it has a uh, mortality benefit and decrease cardiovascular event if you started, you know, uh, the trial, I think it was done 30 minutes after. Is there anything in the guidelines about colchicine? Because I know a couple of cardiologists are adding it, uh, already started using it because of this trial. So did you see anything in the guidelines about colchicine? On the, on the ESC one, no. They haven't had anything about colchicine in ESC, nor on the 2014 ACCHA. So okay. the 2020 ESC, nothing, nothing about colchicine was mentioned. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, any other questions, guys?